All right, so um, yeah, uh, thanks for uh, waiting a bit. And uh, so our next speaker is Thomas uh, Lakonen. Uh, yeah, please correct me if I pronounce your name uh, incorrectly. Um, and yeah, he'll talk about his work on uh, Sharp Sat. Great, uh, thank you, um, hey everyone, and thanks for getting up uh, in in time for this very early talk. I um, sorry for the technical difficulties. I was not expecting to be doing this online, but that's uh, totally my fault, and I'm glad you all waited. Um, so I'm going to talk about this work, uh, graphical shops algorithm for small clause densities, uh, specifically how it applies to uh, the simulation of quantum circuits. It's joint work with uh, Konstantinos Meganesidis and uh, John van der Vetering. Um, so what we're going to look at today is this problem called SharpSat, and we're going to analyze it using the, the ZH calculus, which is a, a graphical calculus that was originally designed uh, for quantum computing. And we're going to use that to find um, an improved upper bound on, on the problem, uh, classical upper bound, like a better algorithm. And then we're going to apply it to simulating quantum circuits. So just as some, some background, we're going to go over the ZH calculus and counter complexity first. Um, and then talk about how we can combine uh, this sharp set problem uh, with, with ZH calculus. We're going to look at uh, the, the best known classical algorithm for the task. Um, and then we're going to see how we can do some, some rewriting of the ZH calculus to get a, a better algorithm and how that applies to simulation. Um, so here's something you're probably mostly familiar with, but I'll go over anyway. Um, if you have some some Boolean formula um, from like n binary variables to, to one binary variable, let's call it phi, uh, then we can say that phi is in a conjunctive normal form when it can be written uh, written like this at the top, where it's written as a, a conjunction of clauses, and each clause uh, is written as a disjunction of literals, where a literal is just um, a variable or it's negation. Um, so for instance, uh, and we will call the, the clause, we'll say it's the clause has width K if there's like at most K literals in that clause. Um, and given you have some phi in conjunctive normal form, um, there's a question we can ask, which is, are there any, is there any assignment of variables like X1 to Xn such that phi of X is one, phi of X is true. And this is the classic Boolean satisfiability problem. Um, we're gonna call this sat. Uh, and we can define a restricted variant of k sats, which is like where the clauses have width at most k. Um, and these are like very classic problems. Sat is like the canonically NP complete problem. Um, but this is not like the only thing we can do uh, with these Boolean formulas in conjunctive normal form. Um, so we can also talk about something called counter complexity. So whereas uh, you may be familiar with P, which is like given a deterministic Turing machine uh, that we, we, you know, we started from some input, we set it going and we see, does it reach an accepting state? Uh, you can contrast that with NP, which is like, we have a non-deterministic Turing machine um, and it may make many paths, uh, you know, it may make many branches uh, and traverse many parts like simultaneously. Um, but the question we want to ask when we're solving an NP problem is, is any one of these parts accepting? Um, so for SATs, this is a, a classic example, is like we might make a choice uh, for each Boolean variable, like whether it's true or false, and then in the end we'll accept or reject depending on whether that assignment of variables was, variables was satisfying. And the SAT problem is asking, is any one of those parts accepting? Um, but we can also ask how many accepting parts there were. Um, and we can define a variant on a non-deterministic Turing machine called a counting Turing machine, which does exactly this. It's like, it can, it's non-deterministic. You can start from some input, make some choices about, uh, about what to do, like arbitrarily based on the inputs, which gives you all these branching parts. And at the end, what we want to do is count how many of those parts ended up in some uh, satisfying, like some, some accepting state. And so this is like the the, anal the counting analog of NP. So we have NP and we have sharp P and these things are like basically the same except what we're outputting is different. Um, and similar to how we have like NP complete problems like SATs, we can have sharp P complete problems, problems which are as hard as every other problem in this class sharp P. Um, and one of these is called sharp SAT. So the idea is given some phi, which is just a Boolean formula from N variables to one variable, 
uh, again in this conjunctive normal form, how do we compute how many solute how many assignments of the variables x make five x true? How many satisfying assignments are there? And this is hard to do. It turns out um, clearly it's like harder than sat. Like counting how many there are, it must be at least as difficult as determining if there exists one. Um, but it, it turns out to be much harder as well. Uh, and this this sharp set problem is actually uh, complete for sharp p. So it's like as hard as counting the number of solutions to any of these uh, any of these problems. Uh, and we again we can define like a restricted variant of sharp k sat, which is when the clauses in phi, which is like the disjunctions in our dis uh, conjunction of disjunctions, uh, are, have width at most k. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna exploit this a, a, at some point. Right, so uh, how are we going to analyze these things? Um, we're going to use tensor networks. Uh, this is a classic approach to, to counting problems. And the specific tensor networks we're going to use are uh, ZH diagrams. Um, so you may have heard of the ZX calculus, which is a, a graphical calculus for quantum computing. And that's made up of two generators, the Z spider and the X spider. And the way they combine is the interesting part. Uh, we're going to work with the ZH calculus, which is similar, uh, but instead of starting with a Z spider and an X spider, we start with these two things, uh, a Z spider, which is this white dot on the right, and the H box, which is this yellow box on, on the, sorry, the Z spider was on the left, and the H box is the yellow box on the right. And we can see these are just tensors, um, and that we have these their interpretation as matrices here, so for the Z spider, we have a one all the way in the top left and the bottom right, and we have a zero everywhere else. Um, and for the H box, we have uh, ones everywhere except the bottom right-hand corner, which is the value A, where A is whatever we've written on our H box. Um, sometimes we'll write them without a label. In that case, we assume A is equal to minus one, just because it's a convenient choice. Um, so from these things, uh, we can define a few more generators, which are again, just, just tensors. So we have these um, Z spiders with phases on the bottom left here. Uh, so if we have a phase alpha, this corresponds to having just a normal Z spider and then like an extra H box uh, with the label E to the I alpha. And we can define an X spider as well, which is very similar to the X spider of ZX calculus, if you're familiar. Um, and it, yeah, it can be written uh, like this on the, on the right where you have a Z spider with a phase and some extra H boxes. Um, just to give an example of what this kind of thing might look like. Um, so what, what we what we do with these generators is we can assemble them into a tensor network. Each of these open wires on the generators is a uh, is an index and connecting two index indices corresponds to a tensor contraction just to the, like in a, a normal tensor network. Um, so for instance, here's a, a ZH diagram. Let's just focus on the one on the top left for now. Uh, we have uh, an X spider, some H boxes, a Z spider with a phase. And we see we, we've connected these with wires. And what this corresponds to is contracting the indices, like the corresponding indices on those tensors, uh, just a tensor network. But what's nice about all these tensors is they are symmetric. Um, so it actually doesn't matter. We don't have to keep track of which indices are which, right? Like in the previous slide, I made this distinction between we have like inputs on the left, outputs on the right. We actually don't need to care about this. These are all symmetric, so we can swap the wires around at will. We can move the indices around, um, and this is exactly the same diagram. Uh, we call this principle like only connectivity matters. So, we've got an example on the bottom right here of something that is the same diagram. I've just like bent the wires around and swapped some of the orders, uh, but it doesn't matter because all these things are symmetric, so we don't care. So yeah, these uh, these both represent the same linear map. Um, one nice thing about the ZH calculus is that uh, you can represent any linear map. It's universal. Um, so just like you you can do that also with a tensor network, but here we, we're picking specific generators for our tensors. Like we're, we're picking specific tensors to be in our tensor network. Um, and it turns out this is sufficient to express any linear map. Um, but the interesting part of these graphical calculi often comes with the rules. Um, so with ZX calculus, it comes with this set of rules, which is, uh, which is complete. Um, and similarly for the ZH calculus, it comes with a set of rules, which shows us how to how to rewrite these diagrams um, so that when we when we change them, we can be assured we still have something that's correct. 
Um, I'm not really going to use the rules in this talk, uh, other than the fact that, you know, there are a complete set of rules. They could be used for all the rewrites I'm describing, but it's a bit tedious to describe how they would be used. So I'm just going to gloss over them, but they, they, they do exist uh, if you need to use them. Okay, so uh, how do we represent uh, sharp stat in ZH? Uh, so there's a, a paper by uh, Neil de Beaudrap, uh, Alex Kissinger, and Konstantinos Mekanizidis. It uh, was given his talk at QPL in 2020. Um, and there's a very simple translation, and it looks like this. The idea is for every variable in your Boolean formula, you create one Z spider, which is the, the one on the left. Um, and for every clause in your um, conjunctive normal form, you create one zero labeled H box, which is the thing in the middle with some X spiders. Um, and finally, for every every literal that's negated, we have this like x x labeled pi spider, sorry pi labeled x spider, which is on the right here. And the way you combine these is you connect a wire between one of the legs of your of your clause here and one of them in the variable if that variable appears in that clause. Um, and what you end up with is a diagram that looks something like the thing you've got on the bottom. Um, where you have all Z spiders on the top, all zero labeled edge boxes on the bottom, and G is just some like wires and negations. Um, so let's just see an example quickly. Uh, for instance, if we had this formula like X or Z and X or not Y and not X or not Y or Z, um, then we can write the following diagram um, where we have Z spiders corresponding to X, Y, and Z on the left. And we have uh, the H boxes corresponding to the clauses on the right, where we've got the first one is represents the X or Z clause, and you can see it's connected to the, the X Z spider and the Z Z spider. The second one represents X or not Y, um, and you can see it's connected to the corresponding variables. Um, and you can see also that the width of the clause, the number of literals in it, uh, determines how many legs your H box has. If it has two legs, it's a clause of width two for example. Um, so how do we solve these things? Um, there's a very simple algorithm for solving the sharp set problem. Um, and it's actually the, be the, like, the best we have in terms of rigorous worst case upper bounds. And the way it works is like this. The idea is if we know X is true and we have some Boolean formula in conjunctive normal form where some of the clauses uh, like X appears, and in some of the other clauses, not X appears, uh, then we can eliminate all the clauses in which X appears because if X is true, those clauses must be true. We can just get rid of them. Um, and we can remove X from the clauses where it doesn't appear, right? If X is false, there's no need to keep it around. Like if not X is false, there's no need to keep it around. We can get rid of it. We just have what's remaining in those clauses. Uh, so this is like a very simple simplification for any uh, Boolean formula when you know a particular variable is true or false. Um, and also, uh, there's another rule, which is variable branching, which is to say, like, the number of total satisfying assignments to some Boolean formula F is the sum of the of two cases, one where X is true and one where X is false. And this kind of, like, seems very natural. It's like we there are only two possible cases if for every satisfying assignment. Either X is true or X is false. So to get the total number, we just add up the, the two cases. Um, and this leads to this like very simple recursive algorithm, which we're going to call CDP, um, which is counting Davis Putnam, which uh, is the, the best algorithm really we have for solving these things uh, in the worst case. The idea is we have a couple of special cases, like if uh, the Boolean format has a contradiction, we know it's always unsatisfiable. If it has no clauses, then it must have uh, like as many solutions as it can. But other than that, we just apply unit propagation wherever we can, or alternatively pick a variable and do this recursive branching. And this turns out to be like the how fast this algorithm runs is all about the choice of which variable do we pick and branch on. And this is very, very important and massively affects the runtime. Um, but given we've just, you know, we've just seen how we can move these things into diagrams, can we interpret these rules diagrammatically? And the answer is yes. So it turns out that the unit propagation rule I described before is exactly equivalent to this uh, this particular equation on diagrams. And this is something you could prove using the rules. Um, I won't go over now how to interpret it, but uh, this is like exactly the same as the, the unit propagation rule. Um, and also the variable branching rule 
also has a has a interpretation which looks like this. The idea is we have this tensor in uh, on the left, which represents like a variable and its surrounding clauses, and we could split it into a sum of two tensors on the right, which represent the case where the variable is true and the case where the variable is false, the same as the the regular variable branching rule. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to exploit the difference between like sharp sat in general. Uh, where the clauses can be arbitrarily wide, and sharp two sat, where the clauses all have width two. And the reason why we'd want to do this is we have really good theoretical upper bounds for sharp two sat. Like we can, we know how to solve it really fast. Uh, if you, if your formula has n variables, we can solve it in like one point two three seven to the power of n uh, time. Uh, in terms of clauses, if you have m clauses, then you can solve it in one point one seven four to the m uh, time, which is very very fast. But for the full sharp sat problem, we have only really bad upper bounds, right? Our best upper bound is brute force, check all the solutions, which is like O of two to the N. So can we translate between the two in order to get some benefit? And the answer is almost. Um, so the difference between a, a sharp set diagram in ZH and a sharp two set diagram is how many legs your H boxes have. So as I said before, an H box has like K legs. If the clause it corresponds to has width K, if we want all the clauses to be at most two, we need all of our legs to be, all of our H boxes to have at most two wires, two legs. And the way we can we can do this is with this rewrite here, where on the left, we have uh, a zero labeled H box with many legs. And on the right, we have a variable with a, like a Z spider with a, with a pi phase written on it um, and a bunch of H boxes with only two legs. And this is good because we've got ridden, we've got rid of our H boxes with more legs than we needed. Um, there's a slight problem though, which is this is not actually represent uh, a sharp two set instance because we've got this sneaky pi phase living on our on our Z spider. And if we go back to the definition of our sharp set diagrams. We can see we just have these Z spiders along the top without any phases. So this doesn't really quite work. And just to show, I haven't pulled this uh, this rewrite out of thin air. Uh, there are some other equivalent ones in the literature. I've got a selection down here. Um, but it turns out that these extra sneaky pie phases don't actually matter. Um, and the uh, there is a analog of the unit propagation rule that holds even when these phases are present. So we have this arbitrary phase alpha and the Z spider in the middle. And it gives you some extra scalars like this E to the I alpha in the output, but like it doesn't really matter. Um, and similarly, there is also a variant of the variable branching rule where it doesn't care about the phases. Um, so in some sense, it doesn't matter if we have these phases. Like it's not formally a sharp set instance, but it's almost a sharp set instance, right? And we can solve it in the exact same way. So this kind of gives us an algorithm for solving these, these instances when we have these phases living on these variables somewhere. And it's it's okay because we've shown that the two, the only two rules we actually use in this CDP algorithm, which are unit propagation and variable branching, still hold when uh, when we have phases. Um, so if we have some phases alpha of xi on, on each variable and they can just be arbitrary complex numbers, uh, then we have uh, these two, uh, we, we can do the same steps of the CDP algorithm as normal. And this gives us like a new algorithm for shop set, for instance, we just apply this transformation and then we just ignore the phases and go right ahead and solve it as we were going to anyway. And this gives us good, uh, good new upper bounds, but uh, I won't go into that now. But one question is how do we apply this to, to quantum circuits? Um, so just like we assembled our shop set diagram out of like generators, we can assemble a circuit uh, in ZH calculus out of pieces. So we can represent uh, plus states, for instance, like this, Hadamard gates, Z phase gates, and post uh, plus state post selections, and also CZ gates and CCZ gates, for instance. This is just like a selection, but there are, you can represent all different gates in this way and, and lots of different ways, in fact. Um, and so once we've got these, we can just connect these together as we would have a normal circuit diagram. So for instance, this circuit on the left, which is just some random gates I made up. Uh, if we start it all on the plus state and we wanted to know what's the amplitude of post selecting in the plus state, that would be equivalent to this ZH diagram on the right, where we just assembled these components and put them together. Um, and we can do a bit of simplification to this. Like we can merge all of these Z spiders together when they're directly connected. And what we're left with is thing with just Z spiders and H boxes. And then the key step is before we had this rewrite, which took zero boxes with many legs 
to a case where we have a Z spider and zero boxes with two legs. We're going to do the same thing here, except now uh, the H box on the right has a minus one face. We can see this is the only thing in our diagram here that we're missing that's not part of a sharp set diagram, right? Like the, the Z spiders are okay. I mean, this has a weird complex phase, but it doesn't matter. So for instance, for our previous example, we've done this rewrite everywhere. We get something like this. And this is in fact a sharp two set diagram. We have just H boxes with two legs and Z spiders maybe with phases connected together. So this gives us like an algorithm for simulating quantum circuits because uh, we can transform any circuit first into a ZH diagram. Then we can do this rewrite to get to what is almost a sharp set instance and uh, specifically sharp two set. And then we can uh, solve it using the good, the CDP algorithm we know, which has good bounds for sharp two set. Um, the way we can analyze this is we can notice that uh, if we work over the Z phase Hadamard and CZ gate set, uh, then each Hadamard and CZ will contribute two clauses to the formula, whereas each RZ will actually be free. Um, so the overall time complexity is like 1.3782 to the number of gates total. Um, so that's basically it. I just want to end with a comparison to other methods. Um, so for instance, this uh, compared to like tensor contraction or like this undirected graphical method, which is something you may have also heard of, um, this this uses less time when you have small number of gates, but like the those methods are exponential in the depth, not the total number of gates. So it really depends on the situation. Uh, one big difference is that this method uses polynomial uh, space instead of exponential space. Um, it's also instructive about comparing it with like stabilized decomposition methods. And stabilized decomposition methods, your Cliffords are free, but you incur a cost for T gates and for CCZ gates. Whereas for this method, most Cliffords are actually very expensive, but T gates are free. So it's kind of like a totally different scenario. Um, and the conclusion here is that I think tensor networks, graphical languages are a nice way to analyze um, counting problems like Shopset. Uh, and we can do some rewriting techniques to use this to get a uh, a new upper bound on sharp set in some cases. And we can also map from circuit simulation to sharp set uh, in a way that we can exploit to get a nice upper bound on it. Um, but the open question I have really is like, can we make this useful in practice? Because uh, while this is actually, a, a, a you know, this is a nice upper bound, um, when you try this with a real sharp set solver, it turns out the formulas this transformation generates are in like some way maximally unhelpful. They really don't help and the the, the performance you get in practice is actually very bad. Um, so if, if there's an alternative translation that would also make this useful, um, that's something I'm very interested in, in looking for. Um, but that's it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, any questions? Um, I have a, one question I wanted to ask. Um, so if you want to um, improve your result, I guess the hard thing would be to, you know, improve the classical uh, um, sharp two set algorithm. But do you think there are some potential improvements in reduction that could uh, make, uh, you know, um, yeah, your algorithm? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, so like both on the on the end of the classical algorithm, like uh, I think there's still ways we can go with improving that algorithm. Um, just like the way it's analyzed currently is you look at all kinds of like what shape can your your instances have, and you show like through just a, like exhaustive case elimination that all of these end up with like a, a low runtime. And um, we could do that more. It's a bit messy, but we could do it. We could do that even deeper. Um, but there's also, yeah, as you say, like I bet the the we can improve much more by coming up with a smarter reduction into sharp set problems. Certainly, a translation that's at least good in practice and that doesn't, uh, you know, is like actually helpful to what uh, how a sharp set solver works. Um, like you may have noticed in this example that all the variables are pure; they never occur both positively and negatively, um, and this is a big problem. Uh, for real sharp set solvers. So if we could come up with a different translation that uh, exploits the, band, the the actual strengths of sharp set solvers, that would be good. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for a cool talk. So I guess I have two questions. Firstly, um, 
does this does this translation work both ways? Like, can I can I view this as a way to solve like two SAT problems on a quantum computer? And is that a sensible thing to think about? Um, unfortunately, not. I mean, okay. it, it it is a way to think about. Like, you could do that, but what you end up with is not just a quantum circuit, but a post-selected quantum circuit, and post-selected almost everywhere. So it's uh, okay. Yeah. Wouldn't be cheap to to run. Yeah. And secondly, do you does it okay? I guess this is a question about your your point that you ended up with very expensive Clifford gates and very cheap T gates. Do you think there's some like freedom that you could change this mapping somehow that you could end up um, I don't know altering this in such a way that you end up with cheap Clifford gates and expensive T gates or some other like some other mapping that works differently or is this very like restricted in how you how you can do um, this? Um, I think you. I mean, so like the. The equivalent problem in the ZX calculus, it has these very nice rewrites where you can remove almost all Cliffordness from your diagram. Um, so it might be that this is also like it's, this is possible um, for the, for the, in for this algorithm as well. Um, so you can certainly like reduce the amount of Clifford gates that you have to convert very expensively into variables and clauses. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's possible to eliminate them entirely. Um, ultimately, it seems that what we're really paying for is like entanglement, like CZs are the expensive ones. Um, yeah. in some sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, cool. Thanks. Thank you. I think we are uh, out of time. So let's thank both of our speakers again. <laughs> and, uh, so it's time for coffee break.